Good morning, everybody. I'm Reinhard Ackerl, and I'm at working at EFSA since 2008. I hope you can hear me well. Good. And so it is my pleasure to, to kick off the second session of the presentation on novel foods. And it is about uh, novel carb carbohydrates as novel foods. This session will be split down into, into three subsections. First, I will talk about novel fiber type foods in general. And in the second part, we will concentrate on a particular group of uh, novel fibers, the, the so-called human identical milk oligosaccharides. And we will, we will close this session uh, by telling you a bit more about novel foods that are intended to replace sugars. So I will start this session and I will tell you about novel fibers or, I mean, these are novel foods that are rich in or consist of non-digestible carbohydrates. And you will see that they are very heterogeneous. They come from various sources and they are produced also in, in all kinds of ways. And the sources are mostly plants, but we have also fungi, bacteria, yeast, algae, and even animals that are the source of these novel fiber type foods. And they are produced by chemical modification or with the help of enzymes or by fermentation, for example. And before I come, I will show you some examples of these novel foods that we have been assessing and that we are about to assess. And just before we get to those examples, I will quickly touch upon the, uh, the adequate intakes for dietary fiber. And those adequate intakes for dietary fiber were set by the NDA panel in 2010. And on the left side of the, in the on the left column, you see the age groups, the various age groups, and on the right hand side, you see the gram per day that are considered that were considered adequate as a daily intake for dietary fiber. And for example, you see for adults, it's 25 grams a day that are considered adequate. From the same opinion, here an extract of information on, on the mean dietary intake in grams per day in a number of, of countries in the European Union. On the left side, adults. On the right side, we took one age group, children from seven to nine years. And as you see for adults, we had the 25 grams per day as an adequate intake, and it's, it's almost never reached just in Poland. It's even above, but I mean, some countries get close to it, but in general for females, it's even worse. So pretty much below the adequate intake. In children, it's slightly different because for this age group, it was 16 grams and they are even above. So it's it seems we did not have information for all countries in the European Union, but for for those represented here, they are quite good as concerns intake of, of dietary fiber. But for adults, as you see, it's a quite different situation. I will now come to uh, show you, to give you an, an impression of the heterogeneity of novel foods, of novel fiber types foods. For example, alpha cyclodextrin we have been assessing and that's an example of a chemically or enzymatically produced novel food. And the starting material is starch. And with the help of an enzyme, the starch or the glucose units, they are converted into a circular structure. And the consequence of this modification is that it can no longer be hydrolyzed by, by, by our enzymes, by our amylases. So it will be non-digestible. The second example, we chose resistant starch, which is a chemically modified uh, fiber type novel food. And here the starting material is high amylose maize starch, which in itself is already difficult to digest. Uh, 
but the applicant uh, modified it further chemically and they created phosphated D-starch phosphate, which is a resistant starch of type 4 and the digestibility is further decreased by this chemical modification. Third, uh, we have an example of uh, a fungus which is which gives rise to this no, uh, novel food, and the fungus is Aspergillus niger, and the novel food contains 90% ketin glucan. It's produced by fermentation, and for this novel food, they use a non-toxic, non-pathogenic strain that is also used for citric acid production. Another example we have been dealing with recently is uh, a fiber-rich novel food from a new yeast. This new yeast is called Yarovia lipolytica. It's, uh, it, the novel food is the dried biomass of this yeast, and this yeast has a history of feed, but not in food. And it contains 25% of fiber, uh, in particular beta-glucan, and in the pre, uh, before, there was uh, the QPS assessment mentioned in the question and answer session. And without going into much detail, I just want to say here that microorganisms are pre-assessed by another scientific panel, an EFSA panel, yeah. and the panel is the panel on biological hazards. So microorganisms are pre-assessed based on an extensive literature search and the biohas panel told us that this yeast species it is considered as qualified uh, presumed to be qualified safe and which helped in the risk assessment process and the yeast cells are in fact killed during the production process here i would also like to point out that we got two more we had received two more novel foods produced by Yarovia lipolytica and they were enriched in selenium and enriched in chromium respectively. So there were two more novel foods which were enriched in these minerals and that also had implications for the risk assessment. <clears throat> I will mention that also later once more. And you have heard about algae already before and also here for the novel fiber type novel foods we have uh, an example and this novel food was or is produced by Euglena gracilis which is a very well researched organism algae but mostly for uh, research purposes and not as food it is already used as food with outside European Union, especially in Japan, but not in the European Union. And also this microorganism, this algae, it got the status of the from the biohas panel and it had received qualified presumption of safety status. And this the dried biomass of this algae is the novel food, and this dried biomass contains 50% fiber. Again, beta glucan. Different kind of beta glucan, but uh, it's a beta glucan as well. Sometimes uh, we received combinations of different fibers and here one example for you is a novel food that was made up of three non-starch polysaccharides which were mixed in a particular ratio proprietary by the applicant and here you see so these three fibers they stem from three different sources the cognac glucomanan is coming from Armorphophallus cognac, uh, a plant also voodoo, called voodoo lily. The xanthan gum is produced by, xanthom, by bacteria, xanthomonas campestris, and the sodium alginate is derived from brown seaweed, kelp, and the novel food was made up of those three. All those previous examples are novel foods that we have already, where we have already concluded the risk assessment. Just to end the examples, I wanted to show you three more cases of fiber-rich novel foods, and those are ongoing right now. 
and one is the Ramno Galacturonan 1 enriched carrot fiber. Then we have we are dealing with chitosan, and the chitosan is uh, derived from the exoskeletons of crustaceans. And lastly, we are also de dealing with uh, bacterial cellulose aqueous suspension, which is obtained by fermentation from bacteria. Uh, quite complicated name. You have it on the slide. Yeah. I hope you got a good impression on the heterogeneity of, of, of these fiber type novel foods. And those novel foods, they, they enter the food chain or they're proposed to be included into the food chain in, in many ways. I mean, this is quite common for all novel foods that sometimes applicants propose to use them as food supplements, but also as food ingredients. And for example, the proposal is to add them to bread, to biscuits, cookies, cereals. Often we have cereal bars, pasta, milkshakes, yogurts, fruit and vegetable juices, beverages, dairy desserts, also meal replacement for weight control, which you can imagine if we talk about fiber, that there is a purpose behind that. Infant and follow-on formula, and as I said, also as food supplements. And the intention is, of course, to increase the intake of fiber. And one can imagine that that could well be the case if somebody eats a lot of food with added fiber. But of course, it's always up to the consumer to decide. So all of this has implications for the risk assessment and the heterogeneity of this novel food makes it quite challenging, but also, of course, very interesting. And I listed, it's not an exhaustive list, but just some considerations that we take during the risk assessment of those novel foods are, for example, whether there are live microorganisms in the novel food, whether they're heat killed or pasteurized, which would kill most of them, but not all. Is there a history of use? And this history of use is closely linked to the qualified presumption of safety assessment that I mentioned before, which is based on existing literature. Then we have to look very closely at the reagents of the production processes, whether there are any residuals of concern and also other co chemical contaminations that could occur during the production process. The production process could be quite extensive, sophisticated, but it could be also very minimal. Like for the algae or the yeast, it's just growing the microorganism and harvesting and drying them. We are looking closely at hygiene and microbiological risk. Uh, for example, often food waste is used as the source to produce a novel food. And that sounds good when you think about sustainability, but it carries its own risks, of course. And well, we look at secondary potential secondary metabolites and anti-nutrients of concern in the novel food. And the species is important. And we look whether it might be a to toxin producer, the species itself or closely related ones. And I don't need to mention that some toxins, like aflatoxins, how, how dangerous they are. And finally, I mentioned before this uh, selenium enriched Jarovia. So for, for this mineral enriched novel foods, we also have to consider, of course, uh, whether tolerable upper intakes are exceeded for, for, the, for the proposed uses for this type of of novel foods. And this brings me to the end of this first part of this session. And with this, I, I will hand over to my colleague Gabriela, who will tell you more about uh, the milk oligosaccharide, human milk oligosaccharides, which have been very prominent recently. But Gabriela will tell you more about this. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhard. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this open session. My name is Gabriela Prekup, 
And uh, as Reinhardt mentioned, I will tell you uh, some more details about another type of novel carbohydrates as novel foods, which are the human identical milk oligosaccharides. So first, I would like to give you uh, just a few words about uh, human milk oligosaccharides to introduce a bit the topic of the presentation. So the interest in uh, milk carbohydrates, as you might probably know, started around the beginning of the past century, influenced by uh, observations that the survival rate of breastfed infants compared to the bottle-fed ones was much higher. This, the researchers attributed this observation um, to the unique composition of the human milk, which uh, of course contains uh, a large amount of oligosaccharides. As you, as you see on the slides, they are the third largest solid component after lipids and lactose of breast milk. But of course, uh, other important components uh, have their part. So from a chemical point of view, um, HMOs are a heterogeneous mixture of glycans and so far more than 150 um, uh, oligosaccharides have been uh, identified and they are characterized by a huge variability in their concentrations and they are absent also in uh, human uh, in, in milk from farmed animals. Uh, recently, the scientists uh, and the industry were able to produce the first oligosaccharides which are uh, structurally identical um, to those in human milk. And they are used uh, in different products, as you can see on the slide in infant formula or follow on formula and so on. And we will see on the next slide, uh, which are those uh, human identical milk oligosaccharides as novel foods. So in 2015, uh, the first human identical milk oligosaccharides uh, the two prime O fucosylactose and the lacto and neotetraose were registered uh, as novel foods in Europe and they were pu produced using in vitro chemical synthes synthesis. So since then, uh, EFSA has received, uh, as uh, Andrea already mentioned, uh, the increasing number uh, of applications uh, of the so called uh, human identical milk oligosaccharides. And you can see on the slides uh, which are those. Um, it's uh, important to mention that uh, so far the risk assessment uh, process has been finalized for seven of them and we have now in the pipeline six more applications so far that will be assessed in the course of 2021. Um, now I would like to give you an insight on the main considerations uh, on the risk assessment of oligosaccharides uh, as highlighted in the novel food guidance. So according to the novel food regulation, these novel foods can fall under one or more of the following uh, categories, which are uh, food with a new or intentionally modified molecular structure, food consisting of or isolated from or produced from microorganisms, uh, fungi or algae. So regarding the identity um, of the novel food, the critical information to be provided refers to the chemical and the structural characterization of the novel food, which uh, of course have to be compared to the natural uh, human milk oligosaccharides. Uh, and here we, we, we speak in terms of uh, structure of the polymer, um, its molecular weight, uh, structural formula of monomers, and of course the starting materials, uh, the nature and degree uh, of modification of the polymer. Uh, moreover, uh, for ingredients that are uh, chemically relevant, uh, equivalent to compounds naturally present in human milk, um, the safety concerns mainly address the factors which are associated to the manufacturing process or the production process. So information on the raw materials, uh, the, the process used, whether it is uh, chemical synthesis or produced via fermentation, uh, for instance, using uh, genetically modified uh, microorganisms, derivative of E. coli, for instance, um, rather than the intrinsic nature of the product. So the critical points uh, include the proof of, proof of absence of DNA, um, also the antimicrobial resistant genes, the, the absence of this, information also on potential byproducts, impurities or contaminants, such as solvent residues, uh, mycotoxins um, or heavy metals. So these substances, uh, which are related to the production process, 
are included in the specification list uh, of the novel food and the specifications uh, define the key parameters that uh, characterize and substantiate uh, the identity of the novel food as well as the limits of the parameters and um, of course for all the relevant uh, physical chemical uh, biochemical or microbiological parameters um, with a particular emphasis uh, for the safety uh, related ones um, furthermore uh, the applicant should specify the form of uses um, whether um, it's uh, specifically for HMO um, as a food ingredient. The food categories in which uh, the, no the human milk oligosaccharide are proposed to be used, whether it's infant and follow-on formula, the variety of food and food supplements, and an appropriate uh, exposure um, assessment must be carry carried out. So in this, in this regard, um, the main considerations for the safety assessment refer to defining an appropriate natural level which is uh, representative for the um, concentration of a given uh, HMO in breast milk based uh, on literature data. It is then uh, possible to estimate the reliable maximal natural intake of the human milk oligosaccharides uh, per, bod per kilogram body weight of breastfed infants and uh, following a similar approach and taking into account the proposed use levels, it is also then possible to estimate a maximal intake of the human identical milk oligosaccharides per kilogram body weight of infants uh, further to the intake of the novel food. So this approach uh, implies the use of a standardized values and therefore a suitable approximation uh, are embedded in the process. Um, this, final, this final step uh, is to compare the intake of the human identical uh, milk oligosaccharides per kilogram body weight to the natural intake of um, the human oligosaccharides from breast milk. And it's important to know that uh, possible consumption that do not exceed a natural intake is considered safe. Um, moreover, the intake in breastfed infants on a body weight basis is expected uh, to be safe also for other population groups uh, when the novel food is added in the proposed uh, food categories. So as uh, anticipated, possible safety, safety concerns are related to the manufacturing uh, process and the possible presence of unwanted substances, uh, whether it's uh, bright products or solvents, rather than to the nature of the major component uh, of the novel food. Um, the toxicological studies, as uh, already mentioned by, by other colleagues, uh, should be conducted in accordance with international guidelines such, such as the OECD and following the principles of GLP. A, a stepwise approach, a tiered approach, uh, toxicity testing should be considered uh, as the default program approach and the basic uh, battery of in vitro test is recommended uh, as a first step and then uh, follow-up approaches in the event uh, of uh, possible of posit positive results might trigger the need for other studies. Uh, genotoxicity studies to rule out the specific concerns and uh, subchronic studies, and uh, generally it's a 90-day study, provide uh, then insight on the behavior uh, of the novel food. And sometimes uh, limited margin of exposure in comparison with the anticipated intake are noted. However, uh, as said, uh, the assessment uh, is mainly based on the comparison of intake uh, estimate. Um, then regarding the nutritional information, the applicant should demonstrate that the novel food is not nutritionally disadvantageous for consumers under the proposed condition of use. So as um, the human milk oligosaccharides are uh, anyway non-digestible oligosaccharides, a limited digestion uh, of the novel mm. food occurs in the upper gastrointestinal tract. So only small amounts are expected uh, to be absorbed. Uh, therefore, they have a, a negligible uh, nutritional impact, uh, we can say. So we hope that um, this short uh, overview gave you a bit of a flavor of the main features of milk uh, oligosaccharides yeah. and uh, this type of novel foods and uh, their relevant assessment that EFSA is carrying out at the moment uh, to ensure that the, the proposed novel food is safe under the proposed conditions of use. Uh, 
uh, I thank you for your attention. And now I'd like to hand it over to my dear colleague, Ocean. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. My name is Océane Albert. I am a scientific officer in the Nutri unit, and I'm going to uh, briefly talk to you about novel foods that are intended to replace sugars. Um, so one may wonder uh, why substances with sweetening properties uh, that are intended to replace sugars are not considered food additives. Uh, and the answer is actually in the food additives regulation, according to which uh, monosaccharides, disaccharides or oligosaccharides and foods that are containing these substances uh, are not uh, considered to be food additives. So it's written black on white. Uh, as a consequence, all monodi and oligosaccharides that have new or intentionally modified molecular structure, as long as uh, that wasn't used prior to May 1997, as uh, explained before, are considered novel foods. Currently, we have a number of dossiers that are uh, under risk assessment for substance, substances, sorry, uh, including multiple dossiers on allulose uh, and one on silobios. Now, uh, you've heard quite a lot already on the uh, risk assessment process, and I would like uh, for this short presentation to focus on the challenges that we meet uh, in the risk assessment of those novel foods that are intended to replace sugars. Uh, one uh, can be found in the production process. Um, indeed, they are very often produced by enzymatic reactions, um, but the novel food regulation um, um, sorry, but the food enzymes are covered by their own regulation and not by the novel food regulation. It doesn't apply here. Um, it is uh, to be known that uh, there is an ongoing broad evaluation of food enzymes that is ongoing at EFSA uh, uh, with the aim of producing a union list of authorized food enzyme, but it's not uh, ready yet. It hasn't been established. As a consequence, uh, during the risk assessment, we can request information uh, according to um, a guidance on the characterization of microorganisms that are used as feed additives or as production organisms, uh, as well as the statement on the characterization of microorganisms used for the production of food enzymes. More specifically, uh, if a novel food consists, contains, or is produced with a microorganism, as um, uh, explained before, the microorganism will be evaluated for qualified presumption of safety, or QPS, by the biohazard panel. If uh, the novel food, uh, uh, the microorganism, sorry, has already been granted QPS, the NDA panel would not question the safety of that microorganism, uh, but other safety aspects of the novel food will have to be assessed and additional data may always be requested. Uh, on a side note, uh, it's important to know that QPS is granted at the taxonomic species level uh, and that it is generally not applied to genetically modified organisms. Now, uh, for all of these novel carbohydrates um, uh, and those novel foods intended to replace sugars too, uh, there can be challenges uh, that are linked to the toxicity testing. The default tier toxicological approach, as described uh, previously by Ermo, uh, meaning the tier one absorption, genotoxicity, subchronic toxicity studies, uh, is not always optimal or even in some cases possible. Uh, for example, some novel foods, such as, you know, plant extracts, uh, they're actually mixtures that are not always very well characterized. And in this case, it can be hard to identify a suitable genotoxicity testing, as one does not necessarily know which compound within the mixture was uh, cause and effect. Uh, again, as mentioned by Ermolaos before, novel foods consisting largely of macronutrients uh, usually cannot be readily tested at doses that are 100 or 200 times higher than uh, the intended human intake, and this leads to a small margin of exposure uh, between the consumption as achieved in the animal study and the uh, proposed use in food. 
Uh, in the case of low or non-digestible carbohydrates, such as some sugar replacers uh, that I've talked about, the rat model may not always be predictive of human exposure. Uh, some endpoints that are affected in the rats uh, after high doses to those low or non-digestible carbohydrates um, may not uh, may be due to differences in physiology and metabolism rather than the exposure to the novel food. Alexandro, uh, I, think, I think someone uh, has their microphone open. Okay, better. To switch the uh, microphone off, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dominic. Uh, sorry about this. So, as I was saying, uh, after exposure to those lower non-digestible carbohydrates uh, in the rat, you would see some effects such as lower body weight gains or increased liver, kidney, adrenal, testis weight uh, that are not necessarily due to exposure to the novel food. So, it's sometimes difficult to discriminate between the toxicological and the adaptive effects uh, in the rat. There are a number, a number of possible alternatives or solutions to these issues, um, one being um, a good compositional characterization of the novel food. This is really of paramount importance uh, for the risk assessment. The control groups uh, and having proper control groups in the studies can be also very useful. For example, in the case of the low or non-digestible carbohydrates, uh, Comparing the novel food to one of those um, uh, LNDCs can be extremely uh, useful. And that's also a point where human studies uh, can be useful, uh, on which I will elaborate a little bit. So uh, human clinical trials, uh, they may provide supportive evidence to investigate potential adverse effects, uh, but that's provided they are relevant and reliable. Uh, they need to be relevant in terms of test material, study population, the dose and the duration of exposure, of course, uh, and a number of other aspects. And they also need to be reliable. Uh, the study design and the execution um, need to be flawless. And so um, it's important to note that the absence of adverse effects in a human clinical trial is not necessarily evidence of safety. Uh, for example, for some novel foods that are intended to replace sugars, some of the effects that are observed in toxicity studies in the rats will not be seen in humans. Uh, they will be hidden. Uh, this also has to do with the large number of endpoints in animal studies that cannot be reproduced in human studies, such as organ weights, for example. Um, and so this is to be uh, taken into consideration. And on a, on a last and side note, I would say that the history of hues in terms of human consumption, uh, when the novel food has been already authorized on other markets outside of the EU, can also prove useful uh, to bring us some information. Now, all in all, this uh, concludes the presentation on novel carbohydrates, uh, which show that as for um, all of the other novel foods, data on the identity, composition, manufacturing, anticipated intake, uh, nutritional aspects and toxicological profiles are all uh, pivotal uh, to conclude on their safety. And with that, I will give the floor to Dominic to open the Q&A session. Okay, thank you very much.